Ein Mal. Ein. Action. So. Oh. Good day, my ICA friend. Uh, today we are very happy to have an interview with the uh, Digital Minister uh, Audrey Tang. And together with me is Terry Cao. Terry Cao is the Global Marketing Officer of SEMI. He also plays a role as the President of SEMI Taiwan. Uh, SEMI is a leading association for semiconductor uh, industry globally. Uh, so uh, we, we are very happy to have uh, Audrey uh, to, to with us today. Uh, so the question will start from Terry. Okay, uh, thank you, Audrey. Uh, first of all, uh, would you like to introduce a little bit to the ICCA member about yourself, and also maybe talk a little bit about your role to play in government or in the non-profit organization. We know you are very active in several uh, non-profit organizations too. Yeah. Sure. Um, good local time, everyone. I'm Audrey Tang, Taiwan's Digital Minister in charge of open government, social innovation, and youth engagement. Before joining the cabinet, I worked with Apple's Siri team uh, for six years on computational linguistics and also participated in many free software and open source communities. Nowadays, uh, I mostly work with Taiwan's DG Plus plan or the Digital Innovation Governance and Inclusion plan, of which we can talk about um, more in the next few questions. Right. Yeah. Yeah, earlier you just mentioned how you were in charge of the DG Plus the mm -hmm. project for yes. Taiwan. Mm -hmm. I think uh, in recent COVID-19, I think Taiwan very mm -hmm. successfully to control the COVID situation and oh, yeah. pandemic. Mm -hmm. So uh, would you like to share some of the experience of how, mm -hmm. how Taiwan government controlled the pandemic mm -hmm. and how by the uh, technology the Taiwan government can also help to mm -hmm. control the situation? Certainly. Yeah. yeah um, as of today, it's been more than 200 days in Taiwan with no local transmission cases. So we're by and large post-COVID now. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is that we reacted really, really early on. Whereas many jurisdictions reacted this year, we reacted last year. Last December, uh, when Dr. Li Wenliang, the whistleblower from Wuhan, posted on their social media that there was, and I quote, seven new SARS cases in the Huanan Civil Market, unquote, um, whereas his voice gets silenced a little bit uh, by his institutions. In Taiwan, it's been reposted by a young doctor on PTT, which is Taiwan's equivalent of Reddit. And not only did it get upvoted uh, so that the medical officers immediately took notice of it, but we immediately started health inspections for all the passengers flying in from Wuhan the very next day, the first day of 2020. So the idea of collective intelligence based on the absolute freedom of speech, of assembly, of the press and so on, is really important because it's like a radar system that um, noticed uh, the existing uh, SARS 1.0 back in 2003 yeah. and noticed that this time SARS 2.0 yeah. uh, is rather like SARS 1.0. So we activated the yearly drills and so on, something that we've been always preparing every year since SARS 1.0. And so I think the most important technology is definitely soap, which mm -hmm. is a chemical technology, uh, followed closely by medical mask, which is a physical vaccine. Yeah. Uh, but the digital technology, although it ranks the third, is important to make sure that people understand that if three quarter of the population wear a mask and wash their hands, yeah. then the R value of the virus will be under one, yeah. meaning that it will not spread in the community. So yeah. from early February to early March, we work for 30 days, making sure that in a mask rationing system, uh, everybody gets access, more than three quarter of people know how to use it with the help of 6,000 pharmacists, uh, 12,000 convenience stores, and countless civic technologists that wrote the apps to make sure that mass rationing works smoothly. Uh, mm -hmm. We did achieve the three-quarter um, KPI uh, by March and then 90% by April, at yeah. which time the uh, virus uh, ceased to make an impact uh, in Taiwan. Okay. I, I, my observation is uh, I think uh, the, the, the government really trusts the people mm -hmm. and also with the support of the uh, technology, mm -hmm. which is also driven by a uh, lot of the uh, civil like, organizations. That's so the, the, the app, which mm -hmm. is very helpful, even for myself, mm -hmm. so I can check on the, yeah. on the app mm -hmm. about 
Also wir konnten die yeah. voll äh, aber die Did you die use the online chatbot or the yeah. map or the uh, voice assistance? There's more than 100, yes. so I was yeah. wondering which one did you actually I use? I use all. I use all. Oh, <laughs> oh, that's excellent. Yeah. 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 So I think the technology really also play a, a very important role to mm -hmm. help the government. Yeah. yeah, definitely. And I also want to highlight that because we publish the real-time mass availability in each pharmacy every 30 seconds. Yeah. It's not just open data, it's an open API, yeah. which enables not only people queuing in line mm -hmm. to keep each other honest, right? Yes. Because if I queue before you yeah. and I uh, swipe my National Health Insurance card, yeah. you can check your phone that yeah. I actually bought nine or ten yeah. medical masks per yeah. two weeks. That's our ration. And it also enables independent data analysis like mm -hmm. the open street map yeah. uh, community yeah. that analyzed the distribution and found out actually it's not very fair at the beginning it's fair if you look at the distance on the map yeah. but if you take into account the time that per people have to do per person uh, for public transportation for walking and things like that it's actually not fair people in rural places have to uh, pay more time yeah. uh, to access the pharmacies which you cannot see uh, on the distance only map yeah. uh, and so when MP uh, Gahon and previously yeah. Yeah. Uh, data analytics VP at Foxconn yeah. Uh, yeah. did that interpolation to our minister Chen Shih uh, uh, based on this shared API data Mr. Chen didn't defend the policy at all yeah. he just said legislator teach us yeah. and then we start co-working and 24 hours later we yeah. work with convenience store and enable much more fair distribution yeah i think fairness and openness mm -hmm. really help to build the trust yes. for both mm -hmm. government and the people definitely yeah. definitely yeah, yeah. Could, could you talk about i think you mentioned in one interview saying uh using rumor to against uh, mm -hmm. um, humor. uh humor again uh, to against the rumor right. uh, to fight with the uh, uh, fake news still mm -hmm. in this uh, pandemic That's time right. can you say something about that yeah, sure so uh, the idea is called humor over rumor okay. uh, and uh, the idea very simply put is that in this time uh, of stress and anxiety many people would believe conspiracy theories mm -hmm. uh, panic buying and so on and all in all we call it the infodemic which is like the pandemic except mm -hmm. it's the virus for the mind okay. right so when people get uh, enraged about something upset about something people would click the share button without fact checking without uh -huh. checking whether it's true or not right mm -hmm. so there was a rumor that says oh instant noodle is going to run out very soon and so okay. people go out and panic by instant noodles there was a rumor that says uh, all the tissue paper material is being confiscated to make medical masks so uh -huh. people go out and panic by tissue papers uh, uh -huh. and so how do we counter that well mm -hmm. we make sure that every time we see such a panic buying or a disinformation campaign within a couple of hours there's a very funny picture wrote okay. out by our premier or by our cabinet member okay. uh, that elicit this idea of uh, humor, of fun, mm -hmm. right? So for example, on the um, instant noodle one, uh, our premier, uh, Su Zhen Chang, our head of cabinet, just mm -hmm. posted this meme of a lot of instant noodles stockpiled uh, and say, uh, huo hen duo jin liang mai. Uh, buy as much as you want okay. uh, and then uh, a small picture underneath saying but don't forget your vegetables mm -hmm. uh, and then all the mayors in the townships and in the uh, cities and municipalities of the agricultural um, lands uh, posted hey don't forget uh, our fisheries too don't forget <laughs> our fruits <laughs> and so yeah. on, right so, so we see the uh, mayors of, of Pingdong uh, and uh, of uh, Tainan of all sorts of uh, agricultural cities uh, just started posted is like a uh, festival of agriculture and so because it's really funny right you left right <laughs> it yeah. means that you're vaccinated the next time you see uh, instant noodle is running out you will not feel the outrage you will okay. not share the conspiracy theory rather you will share this very funny picture of the instant noodle with some vegetables or fruits and so on and so this is called humor over rumor okay thank you for sharing so let's let's talk about uh, our meeting industry because our you know the eCom member we are all in the meeting industry and and nowadays the virtual meeting has become uh, they call it um, uh, we call it a new normal yeah uh, but you know we but all our members we we all embrace face-to-face -face mm -hmm. meeting we believe uh, the face-to-face -face meeting is more easy to you know create kind of uh, intimacy because of the human are yeah. are uh, you know the social animal mm -hmm. uh, but what but but I, I found you are the per, you are a fan of the virtual meeting and, and how can we attract someone like you to uh, to attend a face-to-face -face, 
uh, meaning in the future because we want to earn some money from your pocket. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, of course, uh, I think uh, what's important is that the English word virtual mm -hmm. actually doesn't mean it's less than real. Uh -huh. It means it's more real than real. Okay. Right? When, when, when we say these two are virtually the same, uh -huh. we're, we're not saying these two are not actually the same. We're saying that these two are the same uh, for any uh, you know peoples uh, who have any uh, like uh, criteria of sameness. Uh, uh -huh. Whatever criteria you have, it passes that criteria. That's what virtually means. Okay. It's, it, it, right. It, it's mm -hmm. meant for, as something like literally. Right. Okay. So when we're saying that uh, this is virtually home, I'm saying that this is literally feeling like my home. Right. Okay. So um, if the virtual meetings uh, mm -hmm. are not. Uh, in the same degree uh, of familiarity or intimacy, as you put it, as face-to-face mm -hmm. -face meetings, mm -hmm. then I wouldn't say that it's virtually a face-to-face -face meeting. Okay. Uh, I'll just say it's, it's teleconference, right? Okay. <laughs> it's me talking to a piece of two-dimensional glass. Uh, okay. And so for it to truly qualify as virtual, as uh -huh. in virtual reality, uh -huh. uh, it really needs to feel real, like uh -huh. as in reality. So okay. a lot of my meetings nowadays take place in mm -hmm. virtual reality. Mm -hmm. But these virtual reality meetings, uh, first of all, there's a lot of social elements in it. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't need to hold the controllers. Mm -hmm. uh, I can just use my uh, hands mm -hmm. uh, and we can high five, we can hug, we can uh, do all sorts of things. We can clap and so on. And all these nonverbal interaction patterns are within the mm -hmm. XR space, the extended mm -hmm. reality space. Mm -hmm. And the second thing is that it does not uh, preclude the face-to-face -face part of it. Okay. So, for example, we are having a face-to-face -face meeting now, mm -hmm. but the audience is probably watching it from a two-dimensional screen. Yeah. Now, imagine if we have another chair, an empty chair here, and using augmented and extended mm -hmm. reality, yeah. each of us can just kind of turn on our glass yeah. And in addition of seeing each other, yeah. we now see the fourth speaker here. Yeah. Then for that person, it's much more intimate. Yeah. Because nowadays, uh, with two-dimensional classes, no matter how good the post-production folks are, yeah. it feels like watching a movie. It feels like a large distance yeah. between the audience and the three of us. Yeah. Now imagine if you can just get into the virtual reality and feel that you're on this table uh, or yeah. near okay. this table, right? Not literally on this table, that's a plan. But anyway, the <laughs> idea is that um, you can immerse into the co-creation space, uh -huh. but the co-creation space still take in some face-to-face -face space. So I don't think these two are mutually exclusive if you really implement the virtual reality as a shared reality that's virtually real. Wow, what is a great answer. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah, Terry, so actually, it's linked back to my original question. Mm -hmm. Do you see there will be the new, mm -hmm. uh, new, new type of the uh, meeting format mm -hmm. uh, in after the pandemic, mm -hmm. and also any kind of the uh, uh, even the attendee how they play different mm -hmm. roles is kind of like similar mm -hmm. by you mentioned already. Yeah, definitely, yeah. definitely. Uh, I think um, what does uh, COVID have taught us yeah. is that really linking to even a immersive live streaming experience yeah. mm -hmm. does not require very high-end uh, yeah. equipment. Yeah. Uh, you can do it with your phone yeah. or with just a browser and a URL. Yeah. Uh, so whereas many people as recently as maybe five years ago or 10 years ago yeah. did have some experience with immersive experiences, yeah. Um, all the way back to you know the the VR ML uh, ages, yeah. <laughs> the early web, uh, and, and these are kind of clunky. Yeah. And people understand it's actually not virtually real. It's not real by any uh, degree, right? Yeah. Uh, and so many people do not entertain the idea of that sort of immersive meetings because yeah. they had a bad experience yeah. Yeah. five years ago or ten years ago. Yeah. But now when they reevaluate, yeah. uh, they found out hey, it's actually pretty good. It's yeah. democratized and yeah. so on. So I think. I think it's a great chance for us to clean the cash yeah. <laughs> in, in our yeah. brain yeah. Uh, and uh, accept that really nowadays with uh, the fiber optics and 5G, yeah. which is like a virtual fiber optic everywhere, yeah. even yeah. in outdoor places, yeah. we can get into the low latency uh, mode where when you nod, uh, I know you're nodding to this sentence, not my previous <laughs> sentence, <laughs> which was kind of difficult to tell yeah. if we only have 4G connection. Yeah. 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 Wow. 
So do you believe those IT company will take the leading uh, leading role in the future mm-hmm. of the meeting industry? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, I think uh, a lot of these tools, like the Jitsi uh, environment that I personally set up uh, in uh, our national center for high speed computation, these are open source. Meaning that these are developed by those uh, purpose-driven yeah, organizations, yeah, yeah, and yeah. anybody can just download and run a copy locally, which makes sense because if each your uh, your nodding and action have to go to some cloud in some other country and back, mm-hmm. then we lose the uh, latency benefit mm-hmm. provided by five G and fiber optic connection. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, if most of us are in the same jurisdiction mm-hmm. uh, or in the same time zone, it mm-hmm. makes much more sense for one of us to host. Such a meeting system instead of going to uh, like a very uh, long away uh, mm-hmm. data center for it to be processed and then going back, even just on light of speed um, issues, right? Yeah. Uh, and so I think the on premise hosting. Uh, and open source ones mm-hmm. or very low cost ones uh, mm-hmm. will uh, really take the lead. For example, uh, previously in the two dimensional live streaming, really the dominant technology is OBS or the open broadcasting software. Everybody mm-hmm. uses OBS to compose mm-hmm. their two dimensional live streaming. And that's a piece of open source software. Yeah. You can acquire it for free, you can modify it for free, and you can also distribute your own modifications. Wow, yeah. cool. Mm-hmm. So, have a follow up with two questions. Yes. Uh, some of the, uh, our uh, meeting participants today, uh, they are the uh, meeting organizer. Mm. So probably they are not from the technology mm. or IT background. Yeah. So actually they are very anxious about mm. what's going on and they don't know how to adapt. Mm. So any advice you can mm. tell the, the like a leader, like mm. the meeting organizer mm. or or or, or even personal, how, how you what kind of advice you to give them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, I, I would say uh, it's actually easier yeah. to start a live stream or yeah. even a 360 live stream yeah. uh, or a live like uh, face-to-face like meeting in virtual reality like yeah. in XR yeah. space yeah. or if you want to do it audio only, there's also highfidelity.io and so on. It's all very easy. Yeah. So the most important thing to keep in mind it's just that it gets better with practice. Mm. So with your phone, with your laptop, yeah. try it for, for a while, yeah. right? Try it for a few times. And yeah. you find out it's actually as easy as starting a, a FaceTime call yeah. or a Skype call. Yeah. Uh, and then you get into the habit of doing it more often. Yeah. And, and once you do it more often, then you're not reliant mm. on any particular technological vendor yeah. because you will know the toolkit yeah. of the available choices there. Yeah. And then once you're not um, subject to what we call the vendor lock-in, mm-hmm. uh, and then the creativity part yeah. of a professional organizer, professional curator, yeah. uh, start to uh, play more priority, yeah. right? Then yeah. uh, if you're a vendor locked in to a certain solution yeah. provider, yeah. then basically your creativity is limited yeah. by the feature set yeah. offered. Right. Right. That's yeah. Yeah. yeah, but but most of our member they they host the uh, uh, congress and uh, meetings like more than hundred people or even you know ten thousand people in the future. But mm-hmm. how can they do that with, with the technology you just mentioned, mm-hmm. and how can they make money out of it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, if you have watched any live stream. Mm-hmm. I think 10,000 people watching is considered a small audience. Okay. In our live streams, for example, the one that used to be uh, broadcasted daily by the Central Epidemic Command Center every 2 p.m., mm-hmm. right? 10,000 yeah. people, small number. <laughs> <laughs> the entire country is yeah. watching yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that particular live stream, right? Yeah. So, so first of all, it scales really well. You don't, okay. you don't need to worry about the scaling uh, issues. Uh, the internet is built for this. Um, and uh, the second question is how do you monetize it, right? Yeah. Uh, well, in this case, of course, the CECC uh, yeah. may also be of inspiration yeah. because by the end uh, of the CECC's daily press conference schedule, yeah. uh, they run out of news to report yeah. because every day is just plus zero cases, plus zero cases, and yeah. so on. Yeah. And so they started selling agricultural products. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> right? okay. They will put some uh, watermelon, yeah. right? <laughs> or whatever to, to symbolize the zero <laughs> of that day. Yeah. And then uh, Minister Chen Shizong started a tour, yeah. right? Starting in Kanding yeah. and then goes to all the agricultural yeah. places, yeah. all the different counties, all the way to Nantou and so on. Yeah. And yeah. the press conference went with him, yeah. right? And then people started learning, oh, it's, it's, um, 
okay to go and go outdoors and to resume uh, our activities.、Mm-hmm. And as long as you keep the mask on on the more densely populated places, you don't have to do this contactless、uh, food panda or Uber Eats yeah. anymore. Yeah.、Uh, you can go to your favorite restaurant and say "Singhu la," right? Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. And, and, and basically say,、um, I, "I'm still here." And, and so on. So、uh, when we rolled out the triple stimulus voucher,、yeah. uh, we built a lot of it upon the CECC press conferences.、Yeah. A main message, which、yeah. is, is safe now to go outdoors and, and shop. Yeah. Right. So I think a call to action is really important.、Uh-huh. Uh, it, when your audience is many time zones away,、uh-huh. it, it's actually difficult, like,、uh, to call them to attend a certain booth,、uh-huh. right? Which is what the organizer would do、yeah. if they are physically in the same meeting. Yeah. But if you、uh, make sure that they can also do some actions online,、uh-huh. uh, for example, visiting an online booth, a virtual reality booth, and so on, of course that works、uh, pretty well. And、uh, I attended many online conferences that basically have breakout rooms.、Uh-huh. So after my keynote speech, for example,、uh, I will be shuffled with maybe ten random persons、yeah. um, to a smaller room、yeah. where we can do a round of introductions、yeah. and then just start socialize.、Yeah. Uh, and in more involved, like the Gov Zero,、um, yeah. some. And so on. We even make sure that people order pizza or order the same kind of food、uh, before the teleconference meeting,、yeah. so we can enjoy the same food together,、yeah. uh, and so on. So there's a lot of possibilities、uh, to still、uh, make sure that the catering business,、uh, the associated business of exhibitions, and so on,、uh, can still earn some money、uh, out of those large gatherings.、Uh, but you have to plan it beforehand. And because in Taiwan we never had a lockdown,、yeah. uh, but we. Did at one time discourage large gatherings.、Yeah. So what many organizers did is that they organized a lot of satellite events,、uh-huh. and each satellite event is maybe just 100 people or less,、uh-huh. uh, and preferably in an outdoor place because then you don't have to keep、uh, as long a social distance. Uh, but then、uh, simultaneously, they watch the same keynote, and then they break out in their own discussions, and then there's still booths and there's still exhibitions. Okay, thank you. So the theme of this uh, uh, this congress、uh, in Gaoshan, the Ika Congress in Gaoshan, is、uh, is transformation. Actually,、yeah. we set that theme、uh, back to 2017.、Uh, but because of the, this、uh, pandemic, the transformation, or or some people say digital transformation,、uh, become a buzzword, and and so everybody in our industry talk about transformation. But what does the transformation mean to you? Sure. Digital transformation is roughly speaking three stages. One is just digitization,、mm-hmm. which is making sure that people who want to attend your event、mm-hmm. can do so over the internet, not necessarily face to face. So it's one extra modality.、Mm-hmm. It doesn't necessarily take over the old modality, but it makes sure that the new modality is as easy, if not easier, than the old modality.、Mm-hmm. The second one is called optimization,、mm-hmm. because once you have now redesigned your service. To work with online people, it、yeah. doesn't really make sense for them to only do the same thing as the face-to-face、mm-hmm. people would do, because、mm-hmm. online there's no、uh, restrictions of acoustics and physics.、Yeah. You can make sure, for example, when a keynote speaker is speaking, it used to be that only people in the front row、yeah. get a front row view、yeah. uh, of the kind of nonverbal micro expressions、yeah. on the speaker's face. But、yeah. nowadays, with virtual reality or even with just live streaming, you can make sure that you shuffle people five at a time into this small room, and、yeah. each of them work with a digital double、uh, okay. avatar of the keynote speaker, and everybody enjoy the same intimacy of the、yeah. front row interaction. And that could be done actually quite cheaply, and it's、yeah. been done、uh, for for quite a few configurations,、uh, even that. Uh, I, I've seen musicals、uh, uh-huh. that, after the fact, invite the audience to take、uh, the position、uh, to step into the shoe of、uh-huh. one of the performers,、uh-huh. and then they can encounter、uh, what the performers have performed、uh, as a kind of first-person、uh, perspective, which is impossible to do in a face-to-face setting, of course. But it's actually not that hard to do on the virtual setting. So that's called optimization.、Okay. Uh, and the、uh, third thing, in addition to optimizing. For everybody having a front row experience,、mm-hmm. um, is innovation. You can、okay. make sure that、uh, once this event is over, it's not actually over.、Mm-hmm. You can reuse most of those materials in a way that's kind of a tailor-made experience for people who want to continue their learning from、mm-hmm. it. 
Um, I just attended uh, what we call a 7 on 7 at uh, 7x7.no. It's an art exhibit uh, uh -huh. where I had a um, conversation with um, artists uh, and also making sure that each of our conversations is recorded, is turned into a transcript and so on. And then uh, they fed all those uh, transcripts of everything that I spoke to uh, into a, um, it's kind of hard to translate, um, it's called a lottery poetry uh, or a tian shi tiu tian, right? It is a, it is a special thing. Uh, right? <laughs> so around here, uh, you would go to a temple, uh, you will bring your question yeah. and you will read your question uh, quietly uh, uh -huh. and then get this lottery poetry uh, and, and just uh, randomly draw out a stick and a stick will contain a poetry that you can open and will answer your question and maybe uh, you pay some money for the people in the temple to interpret uh, uh -huh. that poetry for you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so it's a consultation basically. Yeah. And so we recreate that experience in virtual reality so that people at any given time uh, with any question about the topics that we have explored mm -hmm. can bring that question and uh, read a lottery poetry from mm -hmm. the proceedings of prior previous meetings mm -hmm. and then they can just zoom back uh, into the conversation that we uh, did uh, have um, taken uh, but uh, if there are interpretations meaning okay. that if that question uh, is related uh, to our uh, conversation in an out of context way we can also do voice synthesis uh, to make sure that uh, my avatar speaks something I've never said but will uh, logically follow continuously from something that I have said. And that's innovation, because it's not just mm -hmm. replaying from the first person's point of view. It's not just replaying from the front row point of view. This is actually synthesized uh, avatar, right? Okay. Uh, and I don't have to like perform uh, every time that people visit my digital twin performs okay. for me. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so that's the third level of transformation. It's yeah. enabling a new kind of interaction that nobody has thought possible, but given the optimization result, it actually becomes feasible to do. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, under the, uh, the big thing of the transformation, uh, this time the conference has three major pillars. The first one is uh, transparent and the open. Mm -hmm. So would you like to uh, mm -hmm. Give us some of your uh, mm -hmm. observations or sure. your, your own interpretation. Sure, of course, it. of course, yeah. yeah. Um, I think uh, in Taiwan, the counter COVID effort was so successful yeah. because we're very transparent. As yeah. I mentioned, every day uh, at 2 p.m., the CECC answers every question that the yeah. journalist has. Yeah. And anyone who yeah. wants to hear the questions answered repeated again, kind of like the lottery coach, they, they only have to dial 1922, yeah. which is a hotline, right? And yeah. they can just ask any question. And if it has been answered before by the CECC press conferences, the call center people have access to the same knowledge base yeah. and then can explain in much more patient uh, fashion uh, yeah. to the person calling 1922, and that's transparency. Yeah. But also important is accountability, like the ability to give an explanation. Mm -hmm. If people call and the CECC's knowledge base cannot answer that, then it needs to be escalated to the CECC to be answered in next day's press yeah. conference. Yeah. And that accountability is very, very important. Yeah. So, for example, back in April, there was a young boy that called saying, your rationing mask and all I get is pink medical mask. Yeah. I don't want to wear it to school because my classmate will laugh at me yeah. for a boy wearing pink. Yeah. Uh, what do I do? Do I, you know, uh, try to go to school without a mask that will violate the CECC <laughs> guideline. And yeah. the people in 192 cannot answer that. Yeah. And so they just say, we'll escalate to the CECC. Yeah. Yeah. But the very next day, everybody in the CECC press conference wore pink medical mask. Yeah. Uh, and so I think even Minister Chen Shijong said, uh, Pink Panther mm -hmm. was his childhood hero. Yeah. Right? And so the, the young boy become the most hip boy in the class yeah. because, well, only he has the color yeah. that the heroes wear and yeah. the heroes hero wear. Uh, yeah. right? so, so what uh, I'm trying to get at is that transparency coupled with accountability yeah. makes sure that even when we make mistakes, yeah. uh, we can admit the mistakes while giving a competent answer just 24 hours afterwards. Yeah. And so this kind of competency then builds mm -hmm. trustworthiness. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So the other pillar is uh, young energy. Yes. And uh, what, what does young energy mean to you? Mm -hmm. Sure. In Taiwan, uh, we have this idea of reverse mentor. So uh, I'm old now, I'm 39, but, 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 <laughs> back, back, but back, back when I was under 35, 
I was a reverse mentor to a cabinet member, Minister Jacqueline Tsai, Tsai Yuling, mm -hmm. uh, in 2014. Uh, and at the time, many cabinet members started working with people under 35 uh, with uh, what we call reverse mentorship, meaning that the younger people uh, show the direction of the country, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so it could be open data, it could be crowdsourcing and so on. Uh, and then the cabinet members, the older people, make sure that they have the resource that they need to implement those new directions. So nowadays I'm above 35, so I have my own reverse mentors, okay. all, all under 35. And the ministries of uh, labor, economy, national Development council, a lot of those uh, ministries have nominated their own reverse mentors. So all in all, there's 25 people, all under 35, uh, and working very actively uh, with the ministers uh, in the cabinet. And for example, uh, when Huang Weixiang, um, not, not even 30 years old when he entered the Youth Advisory Council as a reverse mentor for the Ministry of Labor, um, petitioned basically in the uh, Youth Met, uh, Council that uh, the World Skills Competition winners uh, need to go to the National Day Parade, just like the Olympic winners. Mm -hmm. Because we have a tradition of every year at our Taiwan's National Day, uh, the October 10th, celebrate the recent winners of any major sport events. Mm -hmm. uh, and Huang Weixiang is like, do you know that the World Skills Competition is also an Olympic level competition? So uh -huh. those skills champions also need to go to that National Day event. Mm -hmm. And so not only did he convince the Minister of Labor immediately, invited mm -hmm. her to uh, Russia, I think, uh, where we won the third place internationally for World Skills, but actually all those World Skills champions not only went to the National Day Parade, but also then went back to the K-12 curriculum uh, mm -hmm. classes uh, to basically do placemaking, community building, and so on mm -hmm. with the people in those middle schools. Mm -hmm. And so for Taiwanese in the middle schools, nowadays, those skilled um, senior high is now not a secondary choice mm -hmm. where you go when you cannot go to the academic mm -hmm. um, high schools, but rather they can work with their role models, uh, someone mm -hmm. they can look up to, those world skills champions, mm -hmm. and then do the placemaking and understand that uh, working with skills education is a easier way for them to contribute to their community as opposed to the academic way. We need to do all this. We need to do all this. Er. So the other pillar of the transformation is young energy and what does the young energy mean to you and do you believe that young energy uh, is the way to uh, innovation? Yeah, I think in Taiwan uh, we have this idea of reverse mentorship where the youth points the direction mm -hmm. and then the older people give them the energy. Oh, okay. <laughs> right. So I was personally a uh, reverse mentor. In 2014, uh, I was the reverse mentor to Minister Jacqueline Tsai Tsai Yuling. Uh, and I was young back then, 33 years old. Uh, and so uh, when she uh, asked me to be her reverse mentor, uh, she explained in the way that I just explained to you, meaning that okay. I will uh, just draft out the directions like uh, crowdsourcing, open data, and so on for the country. But she will make sure that it's actually actually feasible, realizable, and gets the energy and resource uh, to make it happen. Now I'm old, of course, 39, so I have my own reverse mentors, uh, but also more than 12 different ministries each have their own reverse mentors, always under 35, to point the new direction for their ministry. So just one example, the Ministry of Labor have a reverse mentor, the name is Huang Weixiang. Uh, mm -hmm. When he joined, not even 30 years old, he proposed that in our National Day Parade, which is every October 10th, uh, mm -hmm. we already have the Olympic athletes and so on uh, on mm -hmm. the National Parade, uh, like champions, right, to mm -hmm. be applauded. And he's like, oh, every year we also have this World Skills competition. Uh, mm -hmm. It's like a Olympics, but for skilled people. Mm -hmm. uh, and so those champions also need to be on that parade. And so he invited the Ministry of Labor to, I think, Russia uh, last year, uh, and then celebrated Taiwan now, I think, the uh, third place uh, that year. And so not only did the champions go to the parade, but also we changed the regulations so that they can work with, for example, the K-12 middle schools and so on, to show the young people there, their role model, those skilled people, so that in Taiwan, those uh, skilled people uh, in the middle school have somebody they can look up to, so they could convince their parents much more easily. 
instead of you know having to go to the academic senior high school and only go to the uh, skilled uh, high school if you cannot go to the academic high school, kind of a second rate. Uh, starting last year, we promoted so that you actually have the first choice of going to the uh, skilled um, high school to develop your skills, to feedback to the community, because the people in the middle school will already work with those champions on place making activities and making their communities better and making their schools better. So that's a concrete uh, idea by the young people and the uh, Minister of Labor gave the energy <laughs> to the young people so the nation can go to a different and better direction. Wow, it's a very good uh, example. But how do you think about the education nowadays? Mm -hmm. if, if you have an idea education system in mind, what they would be? Yeah, it would be uh, intergenerational, uh, uh -huh. it would be cross-discipline, and uh -huh. it would also be global. Okay. Uh, and, and that's how I learned, right? I dropped out of the middle school when I was just 15 years old. Mm -hmm. And I told the head of the school at the time that I found this new thing called the World Web. Uh, that was 1996, while it was still very new. Uh, and I found that people publish their papers even before they go to the journals. Uh -huh. It's called a preprint server, right? And so on those preprint servers, I just wrote emails to those researchers. And they, they didn't know I was just 14 years old, 15. So they wrote back and we started doing research together. Mm -hmm. And so the head of my middle school, after reading the email printout, mm -hmm. thought for a minute and she said, okay, from tomorrow on, you don't have to go to school anymore. Mm -hmm. You have a larger, bigger, global school, and mm -hmm. I will cover for you, she said, meaning that she will fake the records, so I don't <laughs> get fined by the Ministry of Education, <laughs> right, because it was compulsory. Uh, and so I think um, just like uh, computer science, uh, like uh, the design um, schools, those are, of course, people understand they could be taught and learned online now, but more and more um, studies can be done online with the help of extended reality and augmented reality. So I think um, the disciplines and also the locality should not be a burden for someone who really are passionate uh, in working with a research community or a learning community. And nowadays with fiber optics, everywhere including 5G technology and the lower mm -hmm. Earth orbit uh, satellites that's going to uh, just uh, bridge the last mile, uh, we can foresee a future where anyone who wants to learn can integrate into a school, but mm -hmm. that school is very much decentralized and is everywhere. And, and there is a trend in our meeting industry, according to some research by a German Convention Bureau, is a, a lifelong learning. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, but how, how do you see a lifelong mm -hmm. learning for you know, all the generation in the mm -hmm. future? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, the, as I mentioned, in a reverse mentorship, what's important is that both sides learn mm -hmm. something. Mm -hmm. The younger generation learn from the older generation the wisdom and mm -hmm. the know-how and the personal connections that are in mind uh, mm -hmm. that they have to realize their ideas. Mm -hmm. Whereas the older generation learn about this global perspective on sustainability, uh, mm -hmm. the SDGs, the emphasis on climate change, which wasn't there, right, mm -hmm. 40 years ago in Taiwan. Uh, we're a very much linear economy 40 years ago, right? So this new attitude towards sustainability, that's something the older generation can learn from the newer generation. And the good ideas only comes to uh, fruition when both generations can work very closely together. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. So, Audrey, the last video for this entire program mm -hmm. is diversity. I think the mm -hmm. diversity means a lot. Uh, it, it mm -hmm. also means variety. So, mm -hmm. of course. I want to know from your perspective mm -hmm. what you interpret about it. Yeah. yeah, of course. <coughs> yeah, and this is when I uh, get this mask out. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah. Um, in, in Taiwan, I think we really cherish diversity uh, because we, there's more than 20 national languages in yeah. Taiwan now. Yeah. Um, I think um, there's the 16 or more indigenous ones. Mm -hmm. There's the Taiwanese sign language, also yeah. a national language. Yeah. Uh, and of course, there's uh, the Taiwanese Hakka, Taiwanese Holo, uh, Mandarin, and also the uh, Mazu uh, yeah. language. Yeah. Uh, and all these are national languages, meaning that the same history in yeah. Taiwan yeah. could be interpreted in more than 20 languages. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the strength of our democracy. Yeah. Because in each of those uh, landscapes, uh, we can look at it 
and from a historical point of view, from a variety of views, thereby complementing each yeah. other's views yeah. into a truly transcultural yeah. uh, republic. Yeah. Uh, and so we not only foster the uh, cross-cultural conversations, we also foster transcultural conversations, mm -hmm. meaning mm -hmm. that uh, if I uh, learn a language, like for me, my native languages are Mandarin and Taiwanese Holok, mm -hmm. uh, but if I learn Hakka or I learn one of the indigenous languages, I get to view the early years of my own life, mm -hmm. but from a different perspective, yeah. Yeah. and that's called transculturalism. Yeah. And I think this makes democracy truly worthy because democracy is about everyone bringing a different voice. Yeah. If in a democracy, um, only the dominant language can speak mm -hmm. and nobody else can speak, yeah. then it's not much of a democracy after all yeah. because it's much more authoritarian yeah. uh, as compared to many ostensibly authoritarian regimes. Yeah. If in a so-called democracy, yeah. only one dominant culture have the voice, it might as well uh, be authoritarian. And, yeah. and that was the case 40 years ago in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. right? so, so we all remember how bad it was <laughs> in the martial law days. Yeah. Right? So we don't want to go back there. And I think uh, the identity of democracy and the identities of transculturalism in Taiwan is very much intertwined. Yeah. Then we also heard about someone in a debate about uh, sometimes when we have the uh, diversity and the variety, mm -hmm. sometimes we're satisfied, uh, mm -hmm. sometimes so, so, so mm -hmm. there's an efficiency. Mm -hmm. what, what do you think? Yeah, uh, and, and that's, that's what digital technology can really yeah. help, right? Yeah. Uh, because it's true that if uh, people in Taiwan, all the schools, according to the National Languages Act, yeah. if they want to learn mathematics or learn the natural sciences uh, in indigenous language, uh, and we have to provide it. Yeah. But we can't find at this moment mm -hmm. so many teachers speaking say Sakilaya yeah. to, to all the different schools. Yeah. Uh, so right here, actually, uh, in, the, in this very room, we, we <laughs> held uh, the uh, indigenous language virtual classrooms. Yeah. So there's a very proficient uh, native language speaker of the indigenous language. And uh, uh, before a, um, I think, uh, a green uh, room, um, they just get all those kind of holographic projections mm -hmm. uh, of those indigenous lines yeah. to kind of surround in an immersive way yeah. that uh, class teacher. Yeah. Uh, and so people around Taiwan, each and every one of them can just dial in yeah. into this virtual immersive experience yeah. of that particular indigenous culture mm -hmm. and then learn together uh, across the cultural and also across the transportational boundaries. Uh, yeah. And so uh, I think it really fostered uh, a experience that not uh, your culture is not only about what your neighbors mm. are speaking, yeah. but really what you identify with. Yeah. If you identify with multiple cultures in yeah. Taiwan, yeah. then you get to join those virtual uh, learning circles as enabled by digital technology and immersive technology. Yeah. So whereas it would be more uh, efficient if everybody speak the same language face to face, yeah. uh, digital technologies, everybody can choose their own captions, mm. right? So with the closed caption technology, we're not saying like uh, a online streaming service offering yeah. 20 yeah. different languages captions is inefficient yeah. because online there's no storage limit. Yeah. And it's not like you have to hire 20 interpreters to stand by, yeah. right? Yeah. And so if it could be done asynchronously with assistive intelligence uh, and with minimal um, equipment uh, mm. on each and every viewer's site, yeah. then I think the efficiency argument no longer holds when we democratize the underlying technologies. Yeah. Yeah. So I think you are really the heavy user for all the technology, yeah. but I think I believe you also agree uh, the the high tech also needs to be together with the high tech, right? Now of course, of yeah. course. Yeah, uh, I often say that uh, ICT yeah. connects machine to machine, yeah. which is important. Yeah. But digital connects people to people, yeah. which is even more important. Uh, yes, yeah. it's very yeah. true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so at the end of the section, would you yes. like to give a, a advice to mm -hmm. a young generation? Because mm -hmm. there are a lot of young people. They are mm -hmm. they have kind of anxiety about the mm -hmm. uncertainty for the future. Mm -hmm. And also, would you like to give a, an advice for the mm -hmm. uh, people who work in the meeting industry and uh, uh, exhibition industry mm -hmm. for the future uh, development? Sure. And it's the same message. It's a quote from my favorite singer songwriter, uh, Leonard Cohen. Mm -hmm. um, 
and it speaks to everybody's perfectionism. Because when you're um, really good at something, you tend to uh, be shy about sharing unfinished work with other people. You mm-hmm. tend to uh, just get it done like 99%, 99.99% before mm-hmm. sharing to people. On the other hand, in digital transformation, especially when we're going from optimization to innovation, mm-hmm. nobody knows what the perfect offering looks like. Okay. So it takes people of all the different expertises uh, to co-imagine such a future. And that brings people and people together. And so the Leonard Cohen uh, verse I'm quoting now uh, is from this song called Anthem, and it goes like this. Ring the bells that still can ring. Forget your perfect offering. There is a crack, a crack in everything. And that's how the light gets in. Thank you for listening. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I really like the mm-hmm. quote. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Okay. So, is he very good ending? Should I still do the ending? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, why not? Uh, okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. okay. Okay, thank you. But, uh, okay, sorry. It's okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. okay, thank, thank you, Andrew. Mm. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Audrey. Uh, I think uh, we really enjoyed the conversation with you. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, your conversation really inspired a lot to the, our audience. Mm-hmm. So we are looking forward to see you soon, uh, mm-hmm. no matter in person or virtual. Yeah, thank you yeah, very much. definitely. Okay. So uh, wear your mask, wash your hands, live long and prosper. Wow. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.